right. Through. Okay. Finally, we're ready to test our post-tensioned polystyrene arch. I think we should hang a test load from it and see. Okay. So that's a 20 kilogram weight. That's 40. I'm listening. Is it... A little bit of a creak. Seems OK. I think we can go the same again. Another 40? Yeah, another couple of 20s on. All right. This is just polystyrene. Polystyrene and a couple of small wires. Seven metres in the air. Ed is confident that the polystyrene can take a lot more. Another 70 kilos is loaded, bringing the total to 150 kilograms. And still, the arch stands strong. There's only one way to go. Take it to the limit. 240 kilos. That's half a horse, or four of me, ish. Well, we're really not messing about here. That is a big stack of polystyrene blocks, post-tensioned with that narrow wire that we saw. Carrying about a quarter of a tonne. That's staggering. I, mean, I can't believe it can even hold its own shape, let alone support a quarter of a ton. And seeing post-tensioning in action, seeing it built like that, it, it's kind of strengthened the link for me with my little friend the giraffe here. Because you can see, it's just a series of sections held together by the tension in the cable running through the centre of it. With no tension, it's just a pile of different bits. Put the tension in and it stands up. And that does give me an idea just for one last demonstration, I think, in the course of this experiment, which is what if... Well, there isn't a button, but what if we take the tension out of that system? We could do that. We could do that. Yeah, I think we should. All right, chaps, this is, uh, in the name of experimenting, it's important work. Okay. Do it on go, do I reckon. It. OK. I guess it's quite important we do this all at the same time. Yeah, I think so. More than quite important, it's absolutely <laughs> critical we do this all at the same time. So, for all, uh, apply our bolt cutters to the wire. I'll go three, two, one, cut, and that's when we do it, all right? Then I suggest you run. Right. Uh, uh, everybody on the wire? Is everybody on? Hang on. OK. You on? OK. Three, two, one, cut! <laughs> OK, well, we, we can safely, safely conclude that it was the tension in these cables holding up that structure. Post-tensioning obviously works. The Opera House is still standing. And this would have been if we hadn't taken the tension out of it. Making a huge concrete puppet allowed the Sydney engineers to build a complex shape, but it left them with a different problem. The secret of cheap production is to make the same shape over and over again. You don't want lots of one-offs, different shapes and sizes, like the ones here. It looked as if Sydney's sail ribs each curved differently and would need differently shaped moulds. Expensive. And then Utzon found the answer to building his magical space in this. Now, it wasn't a magic orange with the answer written in it, it was a shape. Because as he peeled the fruit, he realised he'd got it. Each of the cells is a different shape, but they could all come from one curve. It's incredible, but if you took a huge orange 150 metres across, you could make the Sydney Opera House sails out of pieces of the peel. Each sail is a different sized piece of the peel. Because it's the same orange, all the sails curve in the same way. So each of the different sail ribs could be made of the same curved segments. A few for the small ribs and more for the big ones. Production could be simplified. Sydney's roof construction began in 1963, but already the project was under strain, with political opponents sniping at Utzon over soaring costs. The project called for the then largest cranes in the world to lift the concrete ribs. A special kind of feelers worker manoeuvred each segment into position. Sadly, one builder was killed. 
But even so, in 14 years of construction, often with no safety harnesses, that's still an astonishing record. They locked down each rib with huge steel cables, their own version of the puppet strings. These great concrete blocks are the equivalent of the segments in my little giraffe toy. So the ribs were tensioned vertically to stop them slipping and horizontally to stop them falling apart. Oh, I haven't yet found a button you can press to release the tension. And because squeezing the concrete also makes it stronger, it allowed thinner and more delicate looking sails, perfect for Utzon's design. Post-tensioning the sails meant the engineers didn't have to build huge columns inside the opera house, which would have been a bit inconvenient when you're trying to watch the fat lady or man sing. But not even the tensioned steel was enough to lock everything in place. Heat causes the concrete to expand and it contracts when it cools. Relentless swelling and shrinking could force the concrete segments apart. Not good for watertight joints. Worse, it puts an uneven strain on the post-tension structure itself, which could be a headache for opera goers. The tiniest movement in the segments of the roof could have been fatal. One slip and this whole thing would have collapsed like a pack of cards. So it had to be, well, glued. To ensure everything stayed in place, engineers needed a very special kind of glue. They had to look to dentures. These false teeth were made more than 2,000 years ago. A bulky metal brace holds them together. There was no good glue to hold teeth in dentures or opera houses up until 1936, when Pierre Castin produces the first epoxy glue and revolutionizes the world of false teeth. Castan's epoxy created strong bonds, perfect for keeping false teeth in, which was good news for toffee eaters. But perhaps more importantly, it also means that that can stay up. Before Castan's dental revolution, glues needed surfaces to be absorbent, like wood. In the 1930s, a plane like the Mosquito Bomber could only be stuck together with glue because it had a wooden airframe. The glue soaks in, making a strong joint. As planes evolve, designers turn to metal, which, just like the concrete in the Opera House, isn't absorbent. Enter the pioneering Sea Hornet in the early 1940s. Sticking the metal in this plane needs a new kind of glue that forms a strong bond with the molecules on the surface. This family of new glues that form these molecular bonds includes Castan's epoxy. Back at my workshop, I've devised a sticky experiment to pit the kind of glue Castan devised against the old glue. Adhesives expert John Bishop helps me with the epoxy first. Obviously, I just want to run around and chase robots there. It's just like a sci-fi movie, sorry. What do I do? Right, squeeze the trigger yeah. and put a bead up and down. It's very nice, it looks very tasty. It looks like icing. It does. I'm tempted to write my name and happy birthday. When the glue has set, it's time for a little test. Don't worry about your car, by the way, John. It'll be fine. It's going to go head to head with the wood glue used on the Mosquito aeroplane. Can either of them stick concrete or even metal? So, first up, this yep. is the glue that used to hold mosquitoes together. That's the one. Aeroplanes made of wood. Bring it on. Hopes high. No, not at all. OK, yeah. well, it is a big, big ask. OK. Right. In your own time, lift. Elevate. OK, let's see how long it lasts. Oh. That, that hasn't gone then. Oh, I did warn you. <laughs> you did? I didn't believe you, but that's not even tried, has it? <laughs> 